Hello, my name is Kay Olin, and this is The Essence of Transformation. I hope you're going to be enjoying this program. I'm going to have quite a few guests on the show. We'll be discussing everything under the sun. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. Hi. You are watching and listening to The Essence of Transformation. Today I'm going to be talking about my spirit journey photography and the experiences that I've had as a medium and a psychic and a tower reader. I'm going to dedicate this particular episode to the celebration of life for Jonathan Michael Robinson Jr. who passed away on July 5th, 2024. I need to preface this program by saying that I met Jay when I was in my early 20s and I had had an astrology reading done by him of my natal horoscope and it was amazing. He was so accurate. And while I would sit there and he'd say a few things that I could not relate to and could not imagine going through, I would think, oh, no, no. No, that would never happen. Oh, I would never do that. Oh, no, no, I'm not changing in that particular way. Oh, no. <laughs> and it was very, very funny. And uh, he was brilliant, and he ended up being quite right. He also recommended that I go see Betty Lundstedt, who wrote Astrological Insights into Personality. And he told me that I was a psychic medium, and I would be writing a book one day and working in that field. Now, I had not been interested in that, I actually had to look up what a medium actually is. And then the more I understood it, the more I understood that I had really been one all my life. And that's basically the way intuition works in mediums. It's common to have some degree of trauma in your life. And at some point I'll discuss that and its impact on mediumship. But meanwhile, I just want to put this little episode out today in memory of Jay. He was an outstanding person, a brilliant, brilliant historian and astrologer. And I was so grateful to have met him, and he left such a strong impression on me. So I'm going to dedicate this episode to the memory of Jay. I'm going to talk about spiritually speaking, which is what I call the photography that I do. It began with my children's father. When he had open heart surgery, he couldn't do anything but sit outside. He'd get a feeling, take a picture, and animals and angels and spirit and people and ghosts would appear in the photos. In fact, one of the photos is the reason why I understood that he needed to have open heart surgery. And I gave him the name of the test that he needed from the doctor. And they took it two days later, and then they rushed him to the VA Medical Center in Randolph, Massachusetts. He had to have his aortic valve replaced. It had been seven centimeters dilated. Right after the surgery, he got pneumonia. He had lost 10 units of blood, and it was a very traumatic experience. I stayed with him in the hospital and took care of him. They let me stay in his room every night, and I did everything but give him meds. He lived for 13 more years, even though when he walked into the hospital, well, he didn't walk. He was taken into the hospital, of course, in the ambulance. He was, um, all the doctors said, oh, he's a dead man walking. I don't even want to do surgery on him. It's not good for us to have an expiration in our records. It's hard to get promotions and other jobs in the field. <clears throat> However, one doctor, Dr. Virginia Oaks, said, yes, okay, I'll do this. I'll definitely do this. I can do this. And he was fantastic. So I want to talk about spirituality because during that time in my life, I was doing automatic writing. When you do automatic writing, you simply wait for spirit to come in and they'll start to, you can question them. You can do it out loud. You can do it quietly. Have a pen in hand and a pad and let them write to you. And that's how I worked in those days. But as I've grown, the way in which I experience mediumship has also changed and grown. But at the time, that's how I did it. 
That's another story that I'll save for another episode. I want to talk about spirituality because to me, everybody is spiritual. We're all divine. We all come from the same source. We return to it. <clears throat> spirituality is so important. We each experience spirituality in different ways. Some consider spirituality an ideology, a belief, while others consider it a random occurrence. Many consider it invisible, but often hope for manifestations of it. Others pray while many meditate, while many experience their faith organically. It is a part of their body. Is faith grace? No. We all experience grace in our lives, yet you might call it good fortune or luck. It tends to accompany faith. Yet even when faith is inactive, grace arrives, as if by magic, and can change the direction of our lives because it has. Like faith, grace is physical. We are trained to believe neither is physical, but both are. We are trained to believe we are lacking both unless we follow a specific doctrine. However, that is not also true. Look at your life today. Review the journey you have been on and those moments when the very right person, move, job, appeared at just the right time for you. There is a synchronicity we do experience that defies logic and takes place many times in our lives. That is also true of unpleasant experiences that challenge us to the core of our beings and contradicts our belief, hope, faith, the loss of a child, a harrowing illness, long-term unemployment, or the betrayal of someone once respected and loved by you are just a few ways in which we can be chalked or even despairing of faith. We can lose interest in it. This is a part of it. It is also a way in which we grow. We have all been there and will be again. But what about karma? Is karma faith or a belief? When unpleasant news turns up, do you refer to it as karma? You might, for there is no right or wrong way to experience spirituality. Some terms for it may change according to cycles in our development. For myself, karma is a belief, an opinion, a philosophy. It is not faith itself. It is a way to determine favorable and unfavorable outcomes in people's lives, including our own. I consider it a judgment that is unwarranted, in which there is no real evidence that any of us know what a life should be about. And of course, how many lives do we have? If there is any truth to reincarnation, then we might realize that one lifetime, ours or anyone else's, does not give us enough information to address the progress or lack of progress, justice or lack of justice, in any respect for anyone, including ourselves. But people use that term often for reassurance that there will be a paycheck for misbehavior or a reward for being good. The term is also used as a form of manipulation to frighten someone or make them feel guilty. Psychics today refer to the term a high vibration and recommend one raise their energy in complex circumstances to accommodate a higher calling or consequence of being threatened or disappointed in someone. The older cliche was taking the high road. It is a faith-based concept, the conviction that you do have a choice. We have free will, so choose wisely between two options. I refer to it as functioning in the higher octave. No matter what you call it, the implication is that when you have transitioned and are in spirit, you will resonate even more profoundly with others who do the same, so you will be in good company. To my own surprise and spirit work, I found that relational themes with the discarnates are very much like normal relationships in that they do have times of availability. They use language, I speak, retain their personalities, have a sense of humor, love profoundly, feel, or I could say resonate with loved one's sense of loss and grief. Say that when they are thought of, it is like a light bulb goes on wherever they are, and in a second they travel in where the person who is thinking of them is, while the person is meditating, missing them, or hoping for some communication from them. Discarnates know more than we know while we are incarnate, but only to the degree to which they had the same interests before they passed. They see how time on the planet is extremely short. They say there is a God. They do admit 
they made mistakes. Edgar Casey, the author of Many Mansions and popular medium healer, received spiritual information while sleeping. Eileen Garrett, another medium, got impressions through her knees. Dreams, visions, sensations, impressions, automatic writing, psychometry, clairvoyance, clairsentience are more ways in which spirituality is expressed and experienced. There are all kinds of mediums and psychic healers, and I am one of them. For myself, information comes through my dreams, automatic writing, my left side, I get a sensation along my left arm, which tells me, for example, if somebody is honest or not. And I also get it through photography. And if you go to my site, www.spiritually-speaking.org, you will see my work, many explanations about the work, and many, many, many photographs. I'm going to read you a piece that I had written a while back which has to do with this photography. It is a fascinating field. I feel very fortunate to be a part of it. I did not ask for it. I did not even have a cell phone when it first started and I began to see things in the atmosphere, in the yard, in a tree. And I wondered, hmm, okay, maybe time for a mental health evaluation. However, when I got a, a cell phone, which I was asked to do so that I could take photos, of what I was seeing, it came out in my photos. And I ended up having the same gift that my children's father had had. He had transitioned in 2010. And I began to see spirit. We are in third dimension, and but there are other dimensions. And the other dimensions are invisible. However, not to everybody invisible, and certainly not to me. But I didn't ask for that. I had no knowledge of it. So as I took a picture, all kinds of beings, animals, people started appearing in the photos. I would see light, and the light would become an entity. So let's move on. The soul's advantage, discerning. These past few years have been so very interesting. For many, they have been and continue to be devastating, the recurring themes of racial prejudices have exasperated us. The tsunami-like hatred and contempt of others has been beyond words. However, I am hoping to get some words going in, the post, in this post to address the ways in which we travel together. The exposure to excesses, to betrayals, which lead to confusion and cause one to re-examine their motivations and question their values are common. Are we safe? Am I safe? Who is honest? Is anyone stable anymore? In my circle, many people have become ill and died. No matter what philosophy I may have about transitions, when there is one after another, it can be exasperating, and I am not alone in this. There are many kinds of losses we incur along the way. The children who have a really the child or children who have really grown up, the death of a family member, a loss of a job, or a move from one place to another, we have all been there. During these transitions, the essence of loss means we can no longer rely upon someone we once relied upon. We may or may not be able to keep up with the changes, even when they are for the best. Those concerns are not a strain of narcissism, they are a well-rounded truth. It is relational. There was an exchange, a reliable exchange of friendship, work, family, and now there is none. Now it is all up for grabs. A friend of mine is hoping to move, is hoping to move from one state. She has outgrown to another. But in the wake of this change, in a world in which we may not feel safe anymore, the joy of changing locations at 50 is very different than changing at 40. What happened? Extreme violence is commonplace wherever you go. Any semblance of justice has been disassembled and may not be restored in her lifetime. Leaving relatives who live nearby can be a chore, if not downright petrifying, because by now she knows life changes 
and not necessarily for the better. Her own life has changed. She has grown. It is time to go. There is a sole advantage in this process worth reviewing. It requires discernment. Discernment requires honesty. The interior side of your identity is saying, I am on my way. Let's go. It can be fearless. It need not be embraced by you. Change, even voluntary change, can be disruptive and almost, though not quite, unforgiving. But let's take a look at the upside. You are ready, as ready as you will ever be. You do not want to be stuck in the past. There are many forms of communication. Spiritual presence also matters. The most loving relationships continue. Change means growth. Growth matters. The gift is just waiting to be unwrapped. Courage ensues. The grains of happiness are assured. Discerning is a tool. It is a language that speaks to you and speaks through you. It is more than a decision. It is eons of remembrances. It is the hopes of new alliances, the jolt of light after rain, the freedom of self-determination and renewal. What is change? It is the soul's advantage, speaking to you and speaking through you. Let's speak for a second about the process of unfoldment and reunion. This past week was the 26th anniversary of my brother's passing. He was 38 years old at the time. When we were children, we both old. We were both old souls, which means we had a sense of past and the future, a sense that we had understood life, plus the significance of the passage of time that there was no earthly reason for. None of our impressions were based upon any input from any organized religion, and yet we were raised Catholic. The halos on saints, the wings on angels, are and were, in fact, light appealing to us. Prayer mattered, attention from the body mattered, but we did not know why. It took time to find out. Meanwhile, we wondered. What ascended? Your soul. What is a soul? An essence. An essence of what? A core aspect of one's identity or vapor. Oops. That's not fair. It is both. How can it not be both? We must see it as both. Identity and vapor. <coughs> A multidimensional aspect of identity that moves through time and space needn't reveal its primary aspects of identity to us. Not necessarily, and yet it does, in spiritually speaking. You come to see how it does. The soul is the co-creator of time and space, a supernatural aspect of the human experience in contemporary terms and informant. The essence of wisdom, the container of experience, a summation of all that is, it is also who you are becoming. Fascinating. How do we know? Many of us believe we do not know, or we cannot know, or we should not know. Why does one fear it? Because of one's shadow? No, because we often fear what we do not know. And sometimes we fear what we do know. We want to understand and equate knowing with understanding that they are worlds apart and do not rely upon one another at all. It is the soul, the moral compass, we keep answering to, is it? No. Our fear of what we do not know or understand is. It is also the reason for hatred, prejudice, and alienation. Is the soul <clears throat> the bare root of our aspirational selves in motion? Sometimes. Other times, it is a guide. After all, our notions of the afterlife are full of uncertainties, unless, of course, you do experience evidence. Many pray for evidence every day. Receiving grace is receiving evidence. Recoveries are evidence. That paycheck is evidence. Your lover is evidence. Silence is evidence. Union is evidence. Happiness is evidence. Even disruption is evidence. There are many forms of prayers being answered. Most stirringly, perhaps, is death as evidence. Is death of the body an answer to a prayer? Is it evidence of our faith? Is it the successful conclusion to our passage? Sure. Who wants to be 130 years old? 
Who wants to survive everyone they have ever known? Or one's cultural norms, or the capacity to comprehend, move, or to love and be loved? Our bodies are not designed to continue indefinitely for a multitude of reasons, but our souls? Ah, now that's a different story. But back to death for a moment. What does death accomplish? It unlocks the door to complacency. We relinquish control. Many prepare for it. Our lives are full of it. It creeps into our dreams. It has a hold on us. It stands before each of us right now. It has a life of its own. It is a dream we have not had yet. It is a dream we have not had yet. Paul and I wondered, but did not obsess over it. Our grandmother owned a funeral home and lived above it. This stirred our young imaginations. Were we stunned by it, haunted by it, deeper because of it? Oh, but we were children. When we visited our grandmother, we passed the rooms where people were laid to rest. Only they were not resting. When you rest, you sleep. They were not sleeping. They were gone. Lipstick on, hair done, hands folded over, flowers, satin covers in the open coffin, the bodies, starched shirts, suit jackets and ties, a ring on a finger, bodies of clay. We knelt down in wonder before them. Okay, I say to myself, who are you? Where are you? Spiritually speaking, we'll talk more about where they went and why, the ways in which our bodies speak to us and through us, the ways in which we embrace the paranormal or run from it for as long as we possibly can. Enjoy the trip, the union, this voyage out of the shadows into the light of conversation, experience, depth, along with the inference of having some mastery over their frequencies that influence our behavior, our choices, and even our deaths. The next piece will be called The Soul's Advantage. Join me in this process of unfoldment. Is discordance your thing? Why? We'll see how much the song between mortality and immortality has impacted your life so far. What's next? Paul's appearances to me after his passing, which led to healings impossible for the continuation. It led to healings responsible for the continuation of people's lives. What's new? The dreams which inform me of this work as a healer. What's next? Clarity with regard to how my gift of empathy works. What's next? Paul's profound and unwavering role in it. I hope you enjoy this narrative on these experiences and do share your own with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. See you next time. Hello, and welcome to the Essence of Transformation. Today, I'm going to be talking about the book that I have out, which is called Talking About Race, a workbook about white people fostering racial equality in their lives. Now, there were several students in my class when I taught at UMass at Amherst. I taught it through an independent studies program. I asked to teach it through the Women's Studies Department and was sponsored by them because I was from Brooklyn, New York, and I had come to Massachusetts in 1991. And I was very, very surprised at the racism at the university, which I began to go to in 95. I also had gone to Holyoke Community College first and then transferred over. And Holyoke was wonderful. In fact, I've lectured there quite a few times. So I had decided while I was in class, and I worked full time, and I went to school full time, I worked nights full time, and I had decided that I would try to do something about the ways in which the students were resistant to discussing racism specifically. And uh, for the most part, the white students were concerned about being more transparent about the prejudices they had accumulated and the stereotypes that they still believed in and were uncomfortable about. So they were in conflict about their ideals, their sense of being humanitarians, their incredible generosity in other areas of their lives, and yet their total and complete reluctance to get engaged in conversations specifically about racism and white supremacy. So I had come from Brooklyn, New York, and my family is interracial. 
And so I had decided that there was something I could do about this. I had also already been a writer. I had received a scholarship from Kate Millett at the Women's Art Colony beforehand. And I had, and Kate had been the first woman on the cover of Time Magazine. She had written Sexual Politics, The Looney Bin Trip, and CETA, and they were extremely popular for a very long time. And uh, so I went there and I worked on the farm and I worked at my uh, writing and all of us would get together at two o'clock and perform our work. And then we'd go back to our, do our, do our art, whatever it was, whether it was writing or painting or sculpting, and then come back and perform our work again in the evenings. It was a wonderful experience. So I was used to being a creative artist. I had also been a singer. I had sung with the Urban Arts Corps at Lincoln Center for a concert called Children of Adam. And I had done quite a few other kinds of performances. I was an off-Broadway Jesus Christ Superstar, a variety of other plays and concerts. So as you can see, I was used to being an entertainer and I was used to using my voice as an instrument. And I had continued to do that through writing and had been published in many magazines and had begun to find other ways in which I could express myself. Going to college, I was about 45 years old. It was, I was in the classroom with, with students who were my children's age at the time, actually even younger. So it presented different kinds of challenges, but all of them were extremely inspirational. And one thing that one does when they are around younger adults is to thoroughly appreciate the incredible uh, earnestness of them, their hopes for their future, and ways in which they're also quite invested in improving upon themselves. So I found them very communicative in classes. The students of color were resistant to discuss it too because when you start to experience some of the suffering you've undergone, you can become a target. We see that a great deal now. It's on the media platform and in politics. So it's so much more obvious now than it was in 1995. But I had decided to create a course and I asked, could I teach it? And I did for that year. And this book tells you a great deal about the students and it has many of their own quotes in it. And I had gotten it published in 2010. And Howard Zinn, the noted author and educator, had praised it and his praise is on the cover of the book. It's in his second printing. I'm gonna read you just a few of the chapter titles. One is Recognizing Racism. The other is Resisting Racism defenses and insecurities, responsibility and white privilege. Then you have your writing interval, so you can kind of assess and process the very raw material that you'll be reading about and also being more introspective about. And then it's a new identity, what freedom awaits us, and validation for your efforts. I want to acknowledge that I'm deeply grateful to Jeff Hitchcock from CDD Books Incorporated, who had chosen my manuscript and shaped it into the book it became today. And with extreme modesty, he taught me that less is more. Many people are puzzled by the word racist because they are uncertain of its meaning. This uncertainty becomes so unpleasant that when we use the term, we do so with trepidation. We may avoid using it altogether, as if self-censorship will dissolve the power the term has over us. However, it still exists, and it still has power over us. Some of you are sorry the term racist exists, while others are angry about it. Still others are glad to be referred to as racist, even proud. If you are sorry about the term, then you already know what the term suggests, and you probably believe in racial equality. You may believe that racial inequality is not really something you need to deal with, as if it stands outside of your immediate concerns. Yet, when you are called a racist, that personalizes your relationship to racial inequality, whether you want it to or not. Being called racist may take you by surprise and lead you to be open to the idea that you have always had a personal relationship with racism and racial inequality. It is that real relationship 
that the myths that have kept us from it are spoken about in this book. Now, many of the students in class were very dedicated to this topic. They had believed that they did not want to end up being racist like they had seen other adults in their life be. And that was a very interesting aspect of the work, was how do we envision ourselves in the future? What kind of accountability do we have to start to work today on what it is we hope for ourselves tomorrow or for anyone else? And these are some of the points that the students were examining within themselves. We also talked about education because students begin to absorb the racism of those others in their childhoods as preschoolers. Students enter elementary schools without sufficient attention given to them for their notions about race and racism. In middle and high schools, the problem of how one navigates through racism continues. As a result of the lack of attention on this subject, the isolation and complexity of cross-cultural communication continues to be problematic as our students enter college. I had found that students need more support from teachers in coping with the magnitude of the problem of racism in their lives today. School systems are aware of this problem, but do not necessarily know how to correct it. Schools often lack the funding to pursue their own interest in fostering racial equality in the classroom. Teachers often struggle with their limitations in incorporating lessons that deal with racism through their curriculum. When racist messages get carried over from one student to another, they are often dealt with through extreme passivity by others. Educators and administrators are afraid to deal with racism in school. Parents can resent their approach, and they can also be sued. However, throughout the course, I felt I was contributing to putting an end to the silence about racism in our children's lives, no matter their age, cultures, or circumstance. I also felt one important and positive coping mechanism is getting more knowledge of American history and the impact racism has had on our culture. And I felt very strongly that an investigation into the notion of complicity would be a tool in this classroom setting that would assist our students while they make an effort to disengage from racist assumptions about others and themselves. What did I find? I found that while teaching my course, the students' self-esteem was bolstered. Their coping skills increased. They're, they experienced more unity among peers. So it was extremely satisfying for me to have done this work, and I will be speaking more about it at different points in this series of the essence of transformation because actually transforming is what it's all about. It's really what it's all about. It's going deep within. It's paying attention to the beliefs of others around us whom our lives has depended upon so far until we go through the maturation process. And then we have to figure out whose opinion about others is more relevant. Ours? or somebody else's, it's that simple. And once we start to figure out what, what we mean to ourselves, what we want for ourselves, what we believe in, we then start to learn how to navigate our own identity, our own desires, our own aspirations, so that we can really be who, authentically who we are. I want to thank the National Organization for Women. I've been a member for quite a few years. I was actually their national keynote speaker in Mexico for their 50th anniversary, Strength and Diversity, Feminism and Strength and Diversity. And I want to recommend that any, anybody, in the, anybody who's listening today might give them a call at 202-628-8669. Their website is www.now.org. And consider joining if you are not already a member. They have absolutely contributed 
to my abilities and my accomplishments regarding the work that I've been doing on fostering racial equality. And I appreciate it very, very much. I've also am very grateful I was able to make my own contribution on these issues to this organization, and I still do. My workshops have been called The Spirit of Change, Work in the Racial Equality Muscle. And there have been many others. The Unspoken Deep Pain of Racism. So just a shout out to the National Organization for Women, and I do hope to hear from many of you and also to have you on the air as a guest on this subject especially because racism deeply impacts women. It impacts all of us, but it, also, it, it absolutely impacts women in ways that need a great deal of attention, care, and education. Thank you so much. I so appreciate your time today. The essence of transformation continues to be important as we have episode upon episode upon episode and guests. You will see how much transformation is something that we must grow more comfortable with. Something I do hope that you enjoyed this episode. And now it is time to close and say goodbye. I do have a quote I'd like to leave with all of you. And this is it. When you are young, you reach out to time. When you are older, time reaches out to you. I happen to consider both and embrace. I very much appreciate the Northampton Open Media for giving me this opportunity to do the show. And I want to thank everybody who's listening and watching. And I am so looking forward to the next episode. Thank you and have a wonderful day.